This event was sponsored by Spock, the Bootsy Lab for Beautiful Things, PS PDF Kit. With the JavaScript library, you can view and annotate PDF files in the browser. Features include cross-browser support, mobile-optimized UI, and no server-side component. Wild, a digital branding studio, they love GIFs, beer, and weird shit. XXX Lutz, the tech team, XXXL Digital creates all digital experience for XXL Lutz, Mobilix, and Momax all over Europe. Excited to be here again. I was here last year for the first Reactive Conf. Um, today, uh, last year I was talking about closure script and spec. This today, it's really going to be about something I think is uh, more interesting to people who no, don't necessarily care about closure or closure script. This talk is called Out of the Tar Pit Revisited, um, or how, how I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Datomic. Um, so I'm a software engineer at Cognitech. Cognitech is a software consultancy. Um, at Cognitech, we sort of believe that um, that the modern, mainstream software practice actually involves a lot of accidental complexity. And um, there's a way out of that. And we believe that one way out of that is to sort of embrace value-oriented programming. Uh, some people like to say uh, embracing immutability or embrace, embracing functional programming. Um, I, you know, I believe you can embrace the ideas I'm talking about without having to go whole hog and you know, using a programming language like Clojure or Haskell or Erlang. And so I, I want to show that um, these ideas are far more broad um, than which programming language you're using. However, at Cognitech, we totally believe in this stuff, and we use tools that are tailored for value-oriented programming. Uh, the, the first of those that we both use and maintain is Clojure. Uh, that was invented by Rich Hickey. So that's a functional list for the Java virtual machine. I'm the lead developer of ClojureScript, which is simply a version of Clojure that targets uh, JavaScript uh, virtual machines, and as well as Datomic, which probably you haven't heard of. Uh, we haven't been marketing Datomic that heavily outside of the Clojure community because uh, we have a strong user base, user base and it makes sense, uh, sense to people there. However, now that React is like, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, I was in, you know, React fairly early on and I wrote a blog post and we'll talk about that. But it's really exciting to see people, they just get React, right? Uh, in fact, I, I really liked Shirley's talk. It was, it was awesome because we're talking about somebody who's mostly interested in, um, you know, making beautiful visualizations and interactions, but when she talks about how she designs her interactions, the, um, it's really actually as a functional programmer. She really thinks about how can I um, limit the amount of state that I need to get the job done. And that's amazing because if, I mean, I started doing JavaScript in 2005, I mean, that's basically like, you know, this is a complete transformation about how uh, people approach problems and people who don't have an academic background in functional programming, right? React is really, getting people to think about um, things in terms of a more functional way uh, without having you know, too much background in it. So we're going to dig into that. Again, I'm not going to talk that much about Clojure or Clojure Script. It's really about Datomic, but how Datomic might fit into a bigger picture in a world that understands the benefits of systems like React. Uh, this is an image of a tar pit. A tar pit is a good analogy for most um, software, especially when you get to the medium scale or large scale. Um, this is the image that um, is used on the latest edition of Fred's book's very famous series of essays, uh, The Mythical Man Month. Almost everybody's heard of this if you do software. And this is sort of, um, you know, he goes over like how in the 60s they tried to build these large scale software systems and how they failed, effectively failed. Um, and he tried to sort of point out why this was the case. Um, uh, I would say if you fast forward 50 years later, right, that was 50 years ago when he, when he, when he was writing this, um, not much has changed. Uh, and I think uh, React is a, is, a, is, a, is a light as far as the mainstream is concerned. And um, I want to talk a bit about that. But if you haven't read this paper, this paper is specifically um, uh, a response to what Fred Brooks, Brooks was saying. And, and Ben Mosley and Peter Marks wrote this paper called Out of the Tar Pit, which you should run to read this paper. Uh, it's definitely one of the most um, important papers I think that have written, been written about software complexity and how to escape the tar pit. Um, Rich Hickey was definitely heavily influenced by this. In fact, people often attribute quotes to Rich Hickey, which are really just, really just Rich Hickey re-quoting this paper. Um, but basically, these uh, authors uh, point out that one of the biggest contributors to software complexity is sort of unmanaged state. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in the context of React. But they say this, this statement, which again, this statement is just something that you've heard Rich Hickey say, if you've seen his talk, where he says, 
when you're building a software system, more important than testing or reasoning, so you can think of testing as like you know, your TDD or whatever, or reasoning, you'd say the reasoning tools that software tools give you, like whether that's types or IDs or whatever, uh, it doesn't, these other things that you use to reason about your software, the most important property in building a software system is simplicity. And given a choice between um, testing and whatever reasoning tools you have, the one that's going to pay off the most is, um, is simplicity. And this was like, you know, Rich Hickey basically said this, right? More important than types and tests is simplicity. And people were like, ah, oh, no, I want my tests, I want my types. Um, but I, I think that um, really, really realizing those are secondary to building good systems, the first thing you have to choose is simplicity. And that is an, a hard choice. It's not an easy choice. Um, in fact, I would say, you know, React took, I would say, about three years to become as big as it did. You know, I was very early in saying this is really the, the best thing since, you know, slight spread for JavaScript. And everybody was like, I don't know, XML literals. Uh, it's like really weird. I got to learn these lifecycle methods. Oh. And then, you know, once you get it, you're like, whoa, oh my god, what was I doing before? Okay, so in this paper, they talk about this thing called FRP. You may think you know what FRP is, um, but you probably don't, because you're probably thinking like Elm, functional, reactive programming. But that's not what, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about a, a, a new potential architecture for medium to large scale software systems, and that's functional relational programming. Uh, by functional, they don't mean you have to use a functional programming language, right? You can do functional programming in JavaScript. Use React, use Immutable JS, or you know, you know, build a program when you're more disciplined about state. That's being functional. It doesn't matter which programming language you're using. Uh, by relational, when they're talking about uh, what they're talking about here is that basically every single non-trivial piece of software I've ever worked on involves some basically some query power, some ability to specify sort of um, the logic of your program in a declarative way. When you look at really bad programs, it's often because, oh, there's no, there's no, like, the, how, how I manipulate the data is ad hoc. There's a bunch of transformation code. Um, in fact, one of the biggest problems prior to something like GraphQL, when I would sit down and I would work on a UI project, when I was working at the New York Times doing JavaScript stuff, was that, okay, the REST endpoint, like, I can't control what the REST endpoint's going to give me. So the very first thing I have to do is write error-prone error code to transform that result. I mean, raise your hand if you have not done this. Right? I mean, you, if you do JavaScript, it's, it's all you do is transform somebody's REST endpoint that you don't control into something you can actually use. Right? And so the reason, the reason people are flipping about GraphQL, which again, people are like, why would I want to do that? REST is the answer. It's because um, the endpoint doesn't do what you want. Wouldn't you rather write the query that gives you exactly what you want, and you can just go from, I've requested this, and I can just render it. There's no intermediate steps. Um, so this is their big idea, and I think it has legs. And I think we're finally at the point, um, the fact that React, GraphQL, Falcor, all these ideas in the air, I think we can start talking about um, what happens if we take these ideas um, all the way to the database. And that's what Datomic um, does. Uh, what, you're, what most people are doing in the mainstream, um, because it's not like you know, React is very popular, it's great. But there's still a lot of people who are, are not aware of React or not using React yet. Um, and they're, and you know, they're engaged in something else. And in fact, even if you're using React, OK, so you have your little beautiful world in the front end. But maybe you're integrating with something that's like not that beautiful, and it's really messy. And so that mess, you have to deal with it. Um, and that's because most systems are not FRP-style systems, uh, functional reactive programming systems. They're PLOP systems. At Cognitech, we have, we have this word, this, real, this really nice word, PLOP, to, to describe what most people do in mainstream software development. What is PLOP? PLOP is place-oriented programming, right? So before you were doing React, you had your little model, your MVC framework. And you had mutable models, you had mutable views, you had mutable controllers. Right? That was totally normal. When you're doing your back end stuff, you have mutable models, mutable views, mutable controllers. It doesn't matter where. Right? Everybody's doing this. And it all bottoms out in a database, which is an update in place database. Right? When I say place-oriented programming, I'm saying the fundamental paradigm is that anybody can change the state of your system, and you can't do anything about it. And everybody's OK with this. But you shouldn't be, because this is what you're doing to yourself. Again. This is a very technical diagram, very technical. <laughs> you can imagine whatever you want. For the moment, I'm going to ask you to pretend that this is um, you know, like an MVC system. And so you have a bug, and you're like, well, let's look at this model. Is the bug there? Because it's stateful. So maybe, maybe, the, maybe, maybe the corrupted state happened in the model. And it's like, oh, it's not there. Or maybe it is. I don't know. But it doesn't seem like it's there. Then you go to the controller. Maybe it's there. 
Then you go to the view. Maybe it's there. Fuck, I don't know. Maybe it's in all three, right? How can you know? Because 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 state, when you when you when you have different states, it's not linear, right? If I have a, a, a one state and a different thing with state, it's at least exponential, right? At least exponential. And if you have three different stateful things, right? You know, you know, two to the third power. But but actually, you're not building toys. You're building things with hundreds of components. You're fucked. <laughs> um, I just want to I just want to draw this out analogy a little bit home a little bit more. So this is an image. Some of you might know this. I'm a, I'm a huge Go fan. The game Go um, it sort of became more popular because uh, DeepMind had this really great um, competition between their system, the very first version of their system that was public, um, and um, Isidro, one of the greatest Go players in the world, um, world 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 champion. Um, but I want to talk about something specific here, which is that like so. When I sit down to do software, you know, software shouldn't be like Go. I mean, I love Go. I think it's great. Um, but you know, so this is an image from a book. It's called Sumego. So if you do, if you play chess, you know that there's chess problems, and you can do those to get better. And in Go, it's they're called Sumego. And the the point here is that you do these problems to uh, basically develop your sense of visualization. So you need to be able to visualize the state of the board, and in order to solve the problem, you need to be able to in your head see each step of the state of the board. So you, you, you pick a candidate move, and you think about your opponent's response. You can pick another candidate move. And then, then say you made a mistake, and you realize it doesn't work. Well, you have to, have to backtrack in your head right, and go back to where you thought it was OK and then continue. And it's a lot of work. And you know, people, people start studying Go at like six years old until the time they're like 18, because they're going to try to be professional. And they can do this at lightning speeds. They don't, they don't have to play the stones. They can just do it in their head. Same, same is true for chess players. Um, but that's cool. It's a game, right? But the truth is, the truth is, what we do in software when we build these stateful systems, it's actually a lot more like, sorry, this, right? So this is Bao Yun, and he plays. He, he's able to keep the entire state of the board in his head and win games. So he plays blind go, right? There's there's 361 spots on the board, and he keeps the positions of all his stones and his opponent's stones. But this is what you're doing when you're writing stateful programs. You're doing an impossible task. Like he's like the only person in the world that could do this, right? So you you think you're Bao Yun? You're not, right? That you should not be programming like this. This you know it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and I think I think people know this. When you use React, it really by limiting the amount of state you have in your system, it really frees up your thought process to really think about the, the problems you actually care about. Not these accidental problems. That's that's the word we use, accidental complexity. Complexity that's not essential to actually solving uh, the business problem that you have. Okay, so for me, when I when I heard this is this is, I, I wrote this in 2013. This was my a post. Um, some of you may have heard of it. So I was an early adopter of React, and it, it was early uh, even for like the closure community. My friend Brandon was like, you should check this out, and this ended up being a very popular post. And I think by now people have forgotten that I even wrote it. But my point is is that for me. React was like, oh my god, finally. Finally, somebody out there gets it. They actually see the real problem with UI development. This was 2013, so I'd already been doing front-end dev for, for nine years, you know, for eight years. So I'd been doing it for a while. You know, I'd, I'd, worked, I'd, I'd worked on tons and tons of projects, really complicated SBAs. And really, I, by the point React came out, I was just sick of it. I was like, mm, I'm going to transition into back-end stuff. But when React came out, I was like, OK. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is a way to stay excited about doing front end stuff. Um, and I was hopeful. I really wrote this post not knowing what the mainstream was going to think. And it turned out that, again, like I said, React was very unfamiliar. It was very strange compared to what people were doing before. React was actually created by a functional programmer. Um, Jordan Valk wrote the first version in six months to replace their, um, their backbone thing. And he was uh, coming from an OCaml background. So he was very much. Um, well versed in sort of the functional approach, and React is heavily informed by that. Um, so React is good, um, and it's this, this, this one, one last version of this statement is that React lets you give you you can write pure components, and pure components have this beautiful property. You have a component, it takes props, and you get a view. It's always the same. Right? You're not going to get a different thing, right? But that's not how it used to be before when you had stateful stuff. Um, this is why the React people talk about. Most of your components, components should be pure, because you have this amazing power if you do this. It's like arithmetic, right? We teach you know, young children arithmetic. One plus one equals two. 
That's what React gives you. Given this data, given this pure component, you're always going to see the same thing on the screen. Um, and this is something you should strive for throughout your system. I mean, that's all functional programmers are saying. You might hear monads and types and all this stuff, and who cares about that stuff? The most important thing you're getting is this. One plus one is always going to equal two. It's never going to change. And you should be more critical of the parts of your system that are like this, right? You know, prior to React, you were building systems where, like, on Wednesday, it equals three, right? That, that's what you were doing. When you change your dependencies, one plus one equals three. Right? You're, so, so this idea really it, it pervades your system. right? So when your dependencies change, why does everything break? Because the code bases itself themselves are stateful. Right? The code bases themselves are stateful. And people think they can solve this with semantic versioning. It doesn't fucking work. <laughs> um, so anyways, that's how I feel. That's how I feel about modern software development. So now you know my opinions. But I, again, I think that we're, we're on the cusp of collectively uh, having some really big realizations about how to improve this. So again, I'm not here to sell Clojure or ClojureScript. That's what I do. Um, what I like about Clojure and ClojureScript is it actually gives us an FRP stack, a functional relational programming stack. Basically, on the front end, we use ClojureScript, but really, ClojureScript is just a way for us to integrate with, with React. Almost everybody in the ClojureScript world just uses React. You talk to Clojure. Clojure is all you know, immutable data structures in the back end. And then the, the, the thing that we're doing that's, I think, radically different from what's happening in mainstream development, is that we use Datomic. And Datomic gives us the database. We don't have to bottom out in, an, in a plop thing, right? an update in place database. Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, all this stuff. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. They're almost all update in place databases. Uh, Datomic basically has a, um, it has, instead of doing persistent data structures in memory, like immutable JS is a persistent data structure in memory, this actually is the same concept but applied to actually storing on disk. So it creates these thousand-way trees on disk that are immutable. Um, and it works really great. And it's been people have been using it in production for, I think, for about four years now. And we'll see it in, we'll see it in, in action. Um, the, the first thing that you should think about, this is basically like Redux, but it's in the cloud. Right? So when you're doing, you know, when I was talking about React, I said single atom app state's great because you know, databases are just a global atoms. So what's wrong with just putting all your state in one place? And Redux ran with that. And of course, Elm believed in this because that's what the functional programmers were saying that. And ClojureScript, that's what we do if we can. You know, you just put all your state in one place. So this actually takes it all the way to the back end. So you can treat the entire state of the universe, as far as your application is concerned, as an immutable value instead of restricting it just to interactions on the front end. So this is, again, a whole architecture. But there's nothing that's stopping you from switching out the parts that you don't care about. A Datomic now is actually language agnostic. Uh, for a long time, you could use other things, but it wasn't that nice. And now there's a client protocol. Uh, and you could easily use Node.js uh, for the back end part and then React for the front end. You could have the same sort of radically simplified architecture that I'm talking about. Um, so let's talk about Datomic. It's going to have to be pretty quick. Uh, in general, this talk has to be pretty quick. But what are the properties of Datomic? If you've never heard of it before, it's an ACID database. Uh, we're not trying to compete with these like horizontally scalable databases. We don't care. Uh, our, 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 our evaluation is that most, most like people weren't using, you know, people, people were building large systems with SQL and Postgres, like MySQL and Postgres. That was, that was happening. There's nothing that's changed in the ensuing years that make those bad choices. Um, a lot of medium to large applications are perfectly fine with traditional relational asset databases. A lot of the movement away from them was just like, well, they're not that flexible, um, but you sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater. You can actually maintain the relational model um, without having all the restrictions you have around SQL style databases. So Datomic tries to address that. And you'll see that. We're going to go over queries and stuff. Um, it's immutable. So basically, uh, nothing is ever forgotten. You can, if I uh, write a piece of data, I, like my email yesterday was something, and then I get a new email address and I update it, then I can always ask the database, what was my email address yesterday? And there's no complexity around doing this because it's like Git. It's like, it's, it's all there. The whole, the entire history is there. We never remove the history. Um, for legal purposes, of course, if you have to it, truly remove something, you can. But the, but the foundational model of Datomic is that it forgets nothing, uh, and this is really powerful. Um, it, it uses data log queries and rules. Um, I've never had any deep love of, of SQL. I, I, I write SQL if I have to. But um, the nice thing about data log is that it's actually a, a lot more elegant. 
and it's a better fit for um, having to return trees. So when you render, when you do a React UI, you have some tree structured props, right? Your props is, is a tree, right? You're not you're not rendering flat stuff. So um, it's very easy to express uh, uh, graph-like syntax in your queries and get back a tree, exactly like GraphQL. So if you're familiar with the power of GraphQL, then you're gonna you're gonna understand what data log is bringing you with Datomic. And again, to reiterate, it's not programming language agnostic. We currently only have a Clojure client because we're so busy, but I actually started working on a JavaScript client like two years ago. It's not done, but um, hopefully uh, people in this room might be interested in helping me out because I don't actually need it. I want to work on it because I think it's cool, but I would love to work with the wider community to make um, a version of the client that is a great fit for modern JavaScript. Okay. So how does Datomic work? Basically, it's, it's, uh, you record facts. Facts are tuples. Um, you basically have, if you know RDF, you, in RDF you have this sort of subject pred predicate object. Datomic just says something slightly different, but it's essentially the same idea. You have entities, you have attributes, and values, right? So there's an entity, that could be me, and that's represented by a number, and then it has an attribute, person, first name. And then I can see what the value of that, that attribute is. The cool thing about this is you're not restricted to table-based thinking. Sort of like, you know, when you do SQL style stuff, you're like, oh, what do my tables look like? And your migrations are annoying and all this stuff. But Datomic is a sort of accretion model. So I can, I can always define new attributes, uh, and that just works. I don't have to do migration. I just change the scheme. I add a new attribute. And I don't have to be restricted to this sort of table-oriented thinking. But that's, that's the type of facts you do. Entity, the attribute, and the value. Um, and again, this can be completely recursive. This would be a recursive definition. You could be like, OK. You know, um, there's a, I have a, 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 a child relationship, and that can be recursive, and you can write queries, and that just works. And again, we'll see that. Um, the cool thing is that Datomic is really, it's not just a triple, it's actually like a, a tuple, four limit tuple. We add time. So we always know the logical time in which a fact was added. So we can always, we can always recover what the database was before some point in time, and we'll see that. So let me do a whirlwind tour um, of what it looks like. I just want to reiterate, it's not really important here, um, the syntax, it just, the thing I want you to focus on, is I'm going to show you Clojure because it's easier and um, the, the JavaScript client isn't fully working yet, but don't worry about the syntax. I want you to focus on the features and what it might mean for if you're building um, a front end or you're building the back end that goes to the front end and if you had something like Datomic um, to take advantage of. So here I'm going to make a, a database, I'm going to do a bunch of steps that don't really matter, I'm going to load a schema, I'm going to add some initial data, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to record the start time. So I'm recording, I'm recording the time so that I can just go back in time and load the previous value of the database, and you'll see that it's a trivial operation to run a query on the past. And of course you can do, you can actually do queries on, you can do speculative queries, I can be like, I have this database, if I add this information, what's, what, what would be the result? So speculative queries are possible, um, but anyways, what does it look like? So it looks something like this. Um, the syntax, don't focus that much on the syntax, so the syntax doesn't matter, right? Um, the way that Datomic works, you could produce the query syntax however you want. And in fact, you'll see that for JavaScript, what I have planned is a radically different syntax. But this is what it looks like in Clojure. So here I can say, find lat, given a database, given the connection, and this returns a value, like you know, the, the same way that the number one is a value. It's a functional value if I ask for the database. I say, given this database, find all the last names um, where there's people that have that last name. And then I get back a bunch of stuff here in a set because you know, databases return sets. So it's just you know, a relation and it returns the result. So there's some names there. I can go, um, if I go, give me the first name and the last name, it says, you know, find any entities, persons that have first name and last name and return the first name and last name. Right? And then I get, get the set of first names and last names. Um, as you can see, uh, this, this syntax, this tuple syntax, right? This is the entity attribute value. It's always like this. It doesn't matter what you want to do. Um, so I can find, here I can go, instead of having a, a variable, so these are variables. So here I can say find the person that has the name Kovas, first name Kovas, and then return last name. You could do parameterization, all that stuff. Um, there's also neat things uh, being closure in that you can do functions inside the query syntax. So here I can say, so arbitrary closure functions can be used inside the query. Um, 
So here I can say, you know, give me, actually run a function on those, on those values and return the first names. Last names is a single string. Um, things that you might care about is like, is there a negation? Yes, there's a negation. Only find people don't have the last name Smith. There's disjunction. Um, find people, only the people that have telephone numbers or, addre or addresses. And down here I can say, only the people who don't have either of these things. So negation, disjunction work. Um, I can, you know, ask questions like find anybody that doesn't live in Brooklyn, or sorry, find the people that live in Brooklyn, so on and so forth. Now here we're going to do something much, much less trivial, right? So this is like the type of thing you would do with like joins. So here I want to say there's a person named David um, Nolan, and given that person, find all the organizations they belong to, find the names of those organizations, and then find anybody else in that organization and give me um, their first and last name. But I don't have to do, I don't have to, I don't, you don't care about inner joins, outer joins, all this crazy stuff. Right? You, don't, you don't do any of this. It's just a regular tuple syntax. It's just like pattern matching. I don't know if some of you are familiar with pattern matching, I describe the pattern that I want to match, and it just works. So this is going to return, um, uh, I'm, I'm in kitchen table coders, and so find somebody in kitchen table coders. I'm in Cognitech, and so finds Rich, because he's also in Cognitech. So it finds all people that are in the same orgs that I'm in. So this is the same thing you would do in SQL, except you now have an extremely regular way to express this. There's no, again, you don't, you don't care about joins. You, you can just eliminate all the sort of you know, table-based programming you've been thinking about. So this is very much like, um, you know, much more closer to the, the sort of true relational algebra, the theoretical stuff. Um, so down here, so right up, up here, you're, you're, I'm returning tuples, and tuples kind of suck. We're, you know, if you're doing JavaScript or you're doing Closure, you're like, I don't want tuples. I want, I want, I want tree structured data. So here I'm going to show that you can do this. So here I've grabbed um, the person called Kovas, and this is just a number, the ID of the entity. So down here I can say, give me every property, um, all the relevant properties for that entity. And it returns the, fully, the full tree structured data around that thing. So this is not a document store. Right, it simply found, it found the entity and it found all the related references and it pulled everything. And I got back something that I could immediately render with Vera. And this is like, what? This is, this is not even a query. I just wrote, you know, quote, star, just give me everything. Right? So again, this is not a document store, yet I have a result that, as easy to, to write if it was Mongo. Um, so down here, say I only want the first name. So here I'm saying pull, given this entity, I just want to get a map. This could be a JSON object. Just give me, just give me the first name. So GraphQL, right? You only get what you asked for. This is fundamental to the atomic. You only get what you're asking for. So down here, I want only the first name and last name. And then I'm going to get that. Here I want first name and last name in the address. I'm going to get that. And then down here, it's, it's fully regular, just like GraphQL, right? So here I say, I want the first name and last name. I want the address, but I only care about the city. I don't need the other fields in address. Right? So this, this, is, this, is, this is what you want to do when you're doing UIs and you get these crazy payloads. When you, all you care about is you know, this very specific set of data that you need to represent your tree of components. So uh, Datomic is a good, for, good fit for that. So here I'm going to add some new information. I'm going to give Kobos a new email address. And then I'm going to say, uh, find Kobos and find his email addresses. So it returns um, uh, the, the two email addresses. But then here, unlike SQL, without doing a whole lot of work, annoying work, um, here I can say, I recorded the start time at the start of the talk. Give me the database from that point in time, the value. Right? So literally saying, give me what the database was at the start of the talk. And then I go, OK, give me that email. And it's only going to return only the, the one at the start of the talk. Right? So there's no, and did I do any work? No, because because it's just like Git. This is a, it's a fully immutable model, and I can just say, I was at this point in time. Give me give me that thing. You can use and the you don't have to use time. You can use you can use the logical database time. You, the, every transaction has a has a uh, uh, basically a GUID or a squid. We a squid, a unique identifying thing for that transaction. And every time you transact something, you get that. So you can say, I know that this was transacted with this ID. Give me. Give me the database before that transaction ID. Um, so all these crazy things that you could do around time travel that you might be, oh, that's easy to do on the front end because I'm in your little world. Now you have this um, at the whole application level. So 
It's not restricted to just the front end. Okay, so let's move on. Um, there's like a million more things to talk about Datomic, but I don't have time for that. So there is a JavaScript client that I'm working on, and the, the, goal, the immediate goals are we just want parity with the Clojure Datomic client. That's the very first thing, just so people can try it out. That won't, that's actually not that much work, maybe, maybe two weeks of work, really. Um, so a longer term goal is when I started on this two years ago, it was actually a bit before like all the interest around ECMAScript 6 was really hot. It was happening, but it was like people weren't really full on, but now as I would say it's definitely full on. So I want to convert all the source to ECMAScript 6. The other thing we want to do because we want to use it from ClojureScript is that we want this to be Google Clojure Advanced Compilation compatible. Um, so it would be completely idiomatic. I mean, you could, you could consume this from Webpack, but the way we'd write the code, it would be fully uh, compatible with, with advanced um, op compilation. Um, and there, uh, another thing that I worked on is that there's going to be a fluent DSL. So all this Lispy stuff, it's not, we don't, this is not important. It's not important. We don't care about that. Um, this is for JavaScript developers. So we want to make something that makes sense for JavaScript developers. We also generate type information because unlike, you know, these unstructured databases, NoSQL databases, we have a schema. You have to say what your attributes are. You have to say the types. So the same way that GraphQL uses the schema to reflect for you, to tell you what is possible in an endpoint, um, you basically do the same thing. We reflect on the schema to automatically generate um, both type information and all the sort of, you know, you know these little shim classes to make um, your IDE experience uh, really great. Um, so the thing that I worked on, this looks like this. So all that stuff that I showed you, um, it would look like this, and instead of getting closure data, you would just get JSON back. So here I can say, you know, find some title, album, year, uh, you know, uh, pass in a parameter, the artist's name, and I want to find the artist with that name, the track with that artist, the track with the title that I, sp that, that I, that I care about, you know, uh, the medium that was released in CD, LP, you know, cassette tape, whatever, the year, the name, you know, the album name, and then ops, like less than, you know, or equal to the year 1970. So this would be a very completely tailored for um, JavaScript dev, and every time you go dot, we would have type information, so if you're a TypeScript nut, uh, you, you, would get, you would get type directed autocompletion. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing about uh, this that's not tailored to satisfy the needs of uh, different programming language communities. We, we want it to work uh, for other programmers. Um, so anyways, uh, that was a lot, and I'm probably running out of time, so watch these. If you haven't seen these, uh, to get more context, I had to really kind of rush, so I want to get a bunch of points in, but Simple Made Easy is a great talk. Language of the System is a great talk because, again, um, I'm thinking about Datomic in terms of how to fulfill this like simpler overall system. Uh, see, see that thing? If you want to learn more about the philosophy on Datomic, watch Databases of Value. That's, that's where Rich sort of explains what you get if you get to treat your database as a value instead of as an update in place thing. And um, uh, there was a big announcement at ClojureCon, which is that uh, we actually now have um, Datomic is about to be in the AWS marketplace, so it's literally you click a button and you get a Datomic database uh, and it auto scales and does all the fancy AWS stuff, so there's no config. So right now I would say you, you have to be a little bit of a, I mean it doesn't require that much work, but you have to be a little bit more interested in, in understanding how to deploy Datomic. I think that's a challenge and the AWS marketplace stuff means you don't have to learn anything except for clicking buttons in the AWS console. Um, so that's it and maybe I have time for questions, but I don't know. So performance is not going to be like Mongo. So it's, we're not trying to compete with these, with these horizontal. Well, and I have to say, I have to tweak a little bit because now with the AWS thing, hor like horizontal scalability actually is almost a feature there. Like you, you uh, but still, it's, it's the, the problem with Datomic is that right now it's a single writer model, right? So there's it's multi-threaded, but there's got to be one writer. We serialize all writes. So whatever performance you're used to from MySQL or Postgres, you should really think about things in that ballpark. Not, not this sort of like key value store thing. That's not, we're never going to try to compete with that. You can't go back and do data updates. Yeah. 
So we're probably not going to do that, but I also want to say that that sounds like a weekend project. Like that, that's how much work it would take you because this, this datomic, exp so one thing that's not clear is that the schema, when I said, oh, I was doing all this stuff with queries, the, the schema is, is, is exactly the same data, data type as any other data. When you enter in data, the only difference is that the schema goes into a schema partition and your data goes into a different partition. But you can query the schema just like how you query for your own data. And in fact, when we do the cogen for the DSL, I literally write a query that says dump the schema and then I start generating JavaScript files based on that. So, and I, I worked on that for a week. So, and it, I, that it was not hard. Trust me, it's not. So the idea would be um, you're gonna use Datomic, you're like, oh my God, Datomic tells me everything. So doing, doing, doing that, I don't, So, so when I say flexible, it's, it's not going to be as flexible as no schema, right? <laughs> but it's, it's flexible in the sense that, it, that it's, a, it's an accretion model. So if I ever want to add a new attribute, then I don't, have to, I don't have to go update stuff. I just say there's a new attribute. And I just define that attribute, and I can start creating uh, facts that include an entity and the value for that attribute. No, no, no. You do if you want to. If you want to delete delete something from the schema, if you want to rename something with the schema, which are all bad ideas. <laughs> it's always bad ideas to rename stuff. But if you have to do that, then you then you have to do migrations. And there are some tools, existing tools, for doing that. I mean, basically, you just you you, you write a tool just like you would in SQL. You, you can write a tool that you know updates the schema and then runs the transaction that fixes the database. Um, but the point is, is that for adding new information, you don't need migrations. So if you want to make a whole new set of attributes, it requires no migrations. No, no, so, so, so that's another thing about, about Datomic is Datomic is like closure in that we uh, believe that really one of the biggest problems is that we, we, we think you only need this or we think that it should be limited to this and it's almost never true. Um, so it, there's, no, there's no way to, you, so when I say there's no way, that's actually not true. We recommend that you don't write those sorts of restrictions. But of course we do have this feature called database functions and you probably would not be able to write those in client, but you can write database functions that um, would be able to say, before this goes in, I'm going to check the transaction, right? So I just want to, I just want to, I just want to point out that like there's nothing stop. So we have Datomic Pro and Datomic, this new Datomic AWS thing. So you want, if you want to get like, I want to control everything, then you can always use Datomic Pro, uh, which is, you can also use for free. Um, but there you can basically write arbitrary code. To, that can see every transaction that goes to the system. And if you want to do integrity, integrity constraints, you can do all that stuff. So there, there's a way to do this, but not at the level of the schema itself. Beyond, beyond things like this is you know, cardinality one, cardinality many, many um, this is type string, th those sorts of typical things you can do, but these more complicated constraints, you need database functions for. No, no, you can't do this. Um, I mean, no, when I say you can't do this, of course you can do that if you want. <laughs> but I don't recommend it. <laughs> no, no. So it's not, it's, not, it's not open source. It's not an open source database. Um, so that's definitely, um, that's always been like a sticking point. Um, but yeah, it's not open source, but you can use it for free. There's, there's versions of it, it's free. I think the AWS thing, it's like, if you use that, we don't make zero money. And I think it costs you a dollar a day or something like this. Um, it's not an open source database. This is Richicky's baby, so people often get worked up about that. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, I would say Conatech, we, we give away closure script and closure for free. Uh, Datomic is the one thing that Richicky's holding on to, like, you know, the butt. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. 
no, no. So, the, so, so, the, so, the, so I didn't get to talk about that. And you should watch that talk by Stuart Holloway about the atomic on AWS. So the free thing is like this. It's like the solo topology. You could pick the machine size. You can. Um, it's auto scaling and all this other stuff. So you don't care. You don't have to provision AWS. Uh, um, you have to provision Dynamo at all. In fact, if you build an app and then you don't use it, it's gonna it's gonna go back down to the free tier for Dynamo. But there's other costs associated with running the thing. Um, but then there's a the production topology, which is fully clustered, right? So that that costs whatever that topology costs at a baseline, and I don't and I don't actually know off the top of my what that is. But I think on that topology, once you use the production topology, then we make money because um, we accrue some value for you using so many AWS resources. Yeah, so we make money. We would make money, from what I understand, we make money. I mean, we may make money on both, but really, I think most of the money would come from. So it's not it's not a graph database. I mean, all uh, the one thing that I will say it's not a graph database, but you can write graph queries. Uh, to be honest, I haven't really been following Neo4j because they're really sort of focused on the graph thing, whereas Datomic is really just competing with relational asset databases in general. Um, I mean, it's really hard for me to say, but I, all I know is that four years ago people were like, I can write the same graph query in Datomic, and it's like a thousand times faster. Things may have changed in that time with, with, with Neo4j. I don't know, um, but that was my impression was that. They had sort of really focused on this graph theoretic, graph theoretic approach, whereas Datomic, it's really, it's just, it's data log and there's lots of optimizations. And stuff. Um, uh, there's not, as far as like, I mean, I think the AWS stuff is pretty big news. I think the protocol stuff is pretty big news. Uh, I don't know. If, oh, so that's what's cool. So, so a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about, this is what I was trying to say, that the JavaScript client is blocked mostly by me wanting to be awesome for JavaScript. But in terms of the protocol, it's really boring. It's just HTTP. It's just HTTP and we use, we use transit. And so, so like getting the minimal working client, again, it's like, it's like a, it's nothing, it's trivial. Exactly, you could write a go, like you could write the most basic, you, like basically the query can just be a string. You could just pass a string that looks like what I was showing. Yeah, that, that's the most fundamental thing. Um, but uh, most of the work in the JavaScript client is just making it nice for JavaScript. But yeah, the, the protocol is just HTTP, HTTPS. Yeah. Subscriptions, like a scrip subscription model. Oh, so, so I, you know, so again, I, I just want to be careful that there are two products, the AWS thing, I don't, I, I just don't know off the top of my head all the things it does, but actually the original Datomic, the one that's always going to be there, Datomic Pro, um, you can subscribe to the transaction stream. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so there's a there's a channel where you can always listen to all transactions and you can react to them. Yeah. 